For the first time since the 1930s, recent years have witnessed the renewal of discussion in American politics about an idea which calls itself democratic socialism. What do the new American socialists mean, and what are the counter arguments to their policy prescriptions? This episode of The Whole Truth was made possible by William and Susan Doran, UGI Corporation, and by To recap, the mascot, or the jingle. When you're in a bender bender, there's three letters to remember, NJM. No jingles or mascots, NJM. CNX Resources Corporation. Raza Bokhari, John and Patricia Walsh, the Charles Koch Institute. For hundreds of years in English speaking courtrooms around the world, people have sworn an oath to tell not only the truth, but rather the whole truth. The oath reflects the wisdom that failing to tell all of a story can be as effective as lying if your goal is to make the facts support your point of view. In the courtroom, the search for truth also relies on advocates advancing firm, contradictory arguments and doing so with decorum. All of these apply to the court of public opinion, what John Stuart Mill called the marketplace of ideas. This series is a place in which the competing voices on the most important issues of our time are challenged and set into meaningful context so that viewers like you can decide for themselves the whole truth. For more than 100 years, there has been an active and at times a superheated debate in the United States about the proper relationship between the government and the economy. At times, this debate has been characterized as a political disagreement between liberals and conservatives. But at other times, it has been thought of as an American chapter in a global and a titanic struggle between communism and socialism on the one hand and capitalism on the other. Recent years have witnessed the reemergence in American politics of prominent figures like Senator Bernie Sanders and Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who describe themselves as democratic socialists and who call for a form of socialism as the going forward basis for an American system of political economy. On the right, however, the very word socialism remains anathema and is used as an insult so what do the new American socialists want, and are they right to want it? With us to discuss this issue today is Dr. Michael Kazin, professor of history at Georgetown University and co-editor of Dissent Magazine. Michael is also the co-editor of the book, We Own the Future, Democratic Socialism, American Style. And Amity Schles, a New York Times best-selling author and chair of the board of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. This question of democratic socialism and democratic capitalism is a current uh, question in American politics, very current. And I think that this, uh, I'm perhaps dating myself, this comes as a surprise. Uh, most of, uh, uh, this goes back to college days. There was a, there was a lot of talk of democratic you know, socialism and so forth uh, during our college era, but we thought that uh, all of that uh, was behind us. Now we have uh, major politicians, uh, Bernie Sanders, AOC, and so forth, uh, emerging and embracing uh, the label what do we mean by democratic socialism today? Or is that the proper uh, label for what is being called socialist politics in America? Well, Dan, I think there's three different kinds of socialism historically. Uh, one is the kind of socialism that uh, no democratic socialist or obviously democratic capitalist would favor. That is the socialism of Cuba, Soviet Union, China, North Korea today. It's authoritarian kind of socialism um, where everything's controlled by the state. Uh, Democratic socialism is the original kind of socialism that would have uh, society and economy run uh, in a communal way, uh, everybody being fairly equal. Uh, private property would be, you know, for personal possessions would be private, but everything else would be uh, would be owned socially. Um, and that's the kind of socialism which has never existed, and uh, you could argue it never could exist. Uh, it's a rather um, utopian uh, idea. What what when when uh, People like Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez 
and others talk about, call themselves democratic socialists, what they really mean is what in Europe is called social democracy, a term which is never really taken off here. Um, what they mean is that um, there would still be private property, there would still be capitalists, uh, but there'd be a very strong, robust welfare state, much more similar to the welfare states in um, the nation of Scandinavia, to a certain extent, um, uh, the welfare states one has in France and, and Germany, um, but where um, there'd be subsidized housing, um, unions would be very strong, uh, healthcare would be very cheap or, 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 or free, uh, university education, college education would be free. Um, and so there'd be um, a, a very strong safety net. Uh, and um, a lot of what now people pay for in America uh, and that many people can't afford, like medical care, like housing, uh, like even transportation, all that would be available to everybody um, at very low cost or, or free. So that's really what, uh, what Sanders talks about. Uh, and that's why he uh, references FDR, references Martin Luther King Jr., references Lyndon Johnson, the Great Society, Lyndon Johnson, not the Vietnam War, uh, Lyndon Johnson, because right. he sees mm -hmm. them as figures in American history who were trying to promote um, something like this welfare state, though not as, as much as one has, uh, say, in Sweden or, or Denmark. Amity, you're an authority on Calvin Coolidge, uh, who was uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, favorite president. Uh, he's uh, truly one of the most... Uh, uh, significant, it seems to me, figures in American presidential history that uh, are, are just predates uh, the age of mass media. Uh, he served a very successful, could have been reelected, I believe, in 1928, uh, gave way to Herbert Hoover. How did this look from a Coolidge perspective, that is the intervention of the New Deal? Was this, uh, uh, was this a revolution? Was this uh, uh, a moderate uh, sort of adjustment uh, to... Uh, uh, depression era exigencies or what? Coolidge was a polite man, so he just said, "I, I don't quite understand it." <laughs> uh, it, it, it um, and and uh, I, I noticed very sadly the day Coolidge passed away, the Tennessee Valley Authority, that is the socialization of a power project, uh, was on page one. He had opposed that very vehemently a couple times in the twenties and. I always wondered whether seeing the TVA become reality, uh, just as President Roosevelt was becoming president in 1933, uh, gave Coolidge a stroke, um, <laughs> because he wouldn't have liked to see that headline uh, when he died in January 33. Coolidge was a traditional federalist. He, in the Coolidge United States, hard as it is to imagine, the states and the towns were a bigger presence in the economy than the Washington federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, he said America, the, he always spoke, pronounced the United States in plural. The United States are mighty and the federal government is, well, smaller and therefore wars right. in, in the Coolidge view. So that's an entirely different America and it, what a contrast right. between the 30s and the 20s of Coolidge. Right. Would Coolidge and that line of presidents, Harding to Coolidge, would that have represented a uh, step back from Wilson? Wilson was uh, somebody who actually put in place uh, uh, many of the innovations that Franklin Roosevelt would carry forward uh, in, in the New Deal. Uh, did uh, Coolidge roll back Wilsonianism in any way? Uh, yes, he did. Well, that's an important point, sir. Uh, if you think of progressivism as a wave or flood, um, and you put up a wall or a dike, and then there's a hole in the dike, it's Coolidge's thumb that goes in. He personally uh, held progressivism back, and recall that progressives were in his own party. There was a third party, right. the party of Wafala in the 20s, and that what many people in that party were Republicans along with the Wilsonian, some Wilsonian Democrats. Right. Uh, and he said, no, that's not how I conceive the party or, or the country. And what's very interesting, and I think we um, were chatting about this before uh, the show got started, Coolidge uh, became president in 1923 because tragically Warren Harding passed away. The Coolidge had to run for office in 1924, and when he ran for office, there was a mighty third party, the progressives. Right. So people thought, well, the Republicans might lose, as they often do in their three parties. Uh, instead, Coolidge took an absolute majority, not merely a 
plurality. He took more than the Democrats and the progressives who were sort of pro-life combined to win in 24. So for the moment, um, his ideas or the ideas of a more restrained free market America were very popular. Yeah, they were popular, and uh, I would say that uh, socialism historically has been a kind of uh, insult in American politics. In other words, this is a label yes. that you hurl at somebody you do not like. So I guess uh, an interesting question I would, or a question that interests me is why Democratic politicians who claim that they are reformers in the mold of a Franklin Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson would embrace uh, that la label. In other words, a, a label which has been historically very unpopular. Maybe I've got this wrong, but in the 1930s, uh, the U.S. government was in almost complete control of the U.S. economy, meaning we had a nation, national economy. Today we have an international economy. Uh, if uh, one segment of that economy decides to raise taxes, let's say, to provide free school uh, or universal health care or uh, uh, health coverage as a right and that type of thing, all of these uh, things which uh, bear a lot of expense can't. Capital just run away, uh, uh, sort of defeating the purpose. Uh, aren't we in some sort of uh, uh, golden, or what, what do they call it, the uh, golden street jacket? Uh, Thomas Friedman did. There's only so much the government can do uh, in an international economy without losing your economy. Well, first, first, a lot of our competitors already have welfare states, as I mentioned before. Uh, much of Europe does. You know, China has a bad one, but uh, uh, but it still has one. Um, and and so, you know, if they can afford it, uh, I think we can afford it. Also, I think, you know, under um, the last over the last 50 years, actually, a lot of manufacturing is already going overseas, as you know, um, uh, because of uh, cheaper labor, uh, because of less regulation. But uh, and it's been replaced by a thriving healthcare industry, educational industry, uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, so, you know, I think. Um, to the degree that uh, our economy was doing well uh, before the pandemic, and uh, hopefully it'll start to do well again this year. Uh, you know, I think if um, people are more, um, um, uh, what should I say, uh, comfortable, uh, that they won't have to worry about what happens if they get sick, uh, that they'll be able to go to school pretty cheaply, public school that is, public colleges, as they could in the 50s and 60s, by the way, when the economy was doing very well, uh, before tuition hikes went really up on, on public colleges, then I think actually we'll have a happier workforce, a more productive workforce, uh, and the kind of industries that um, that uh, were thriving before will continue to thrive. Uh, you know, we're not going to have uh, mass manufacturing, I think, going forward. Um, um, and you know, that is going to be, uh, developing countries are going to be uh, producing one of these goods more and more, uh, except for specialty goods. So I think, uh, you know, it's a problem, obviously, but but I'd rather uh, try to provide a decent income and decent uh, uh, jobs uh, for a uh, majority of Americans than worry about uh, whether this industry or that industry will go overseas uh, to a poorer country. If uh, And most of these, after all, with... with uh, uh, this wonderful, sometimes wonderful technology we have, the internet, you know, so much work can be done, you know, from different parts of the world anyway. So, um, you know, you might find Americans working for American companies living in, in Sweden, you know, uh, more and more. Um, so uh, I think, look, I'm not an economist and I, I, I don't know what the future economy is going to look like. Uh, but I do think that more and more uh, other citizens in other countries are demanding uh, more equal societies just as American citizens are. And so, you know, I don't think uh, other societies are going to stand still with more unequal uh, societies while we become more equal. Uh, I doubt that's going to happen. What you're saying is that socialism is compatible with open borders. Social, social democracy is. Social democracy is, yeah. Very important. Uh, I, I, again, I, I think it's really important to, to make the distinction. Look, Sweden has more billionaires per capita than the United States, you know. Uh, but they also have a great welfare state. So, uh, you know, uh, the people who run Volvo and Saab and, and uh, uh, the other big Swedish companies, you know, they're, they're doing just fine with social democracy. Um, so um, that seems to me that, you know, uh, there's no reason why we can as well. We're looking toward European examples, correct? Uh, these are, uh, yep. yeah, we're looking toward uh, European examples, which, by the way, is something America, I, at least my reading, doesn't do very often. We don't look overseas for models very often. 
Uh, actually, the, the progressives we talked about earlier, Amity probably knows about this, you know, they, they actually did learn a lot from uh, William James Bryan, who I wrote a biography about. Uh, he spent time in Europe, and right. he, was, he praised Study German. Uh, municipal ownership, and uh, right. he thought the German Socialist Democratic Party was a pretty good party. Right. It's just, you know, they were atheists, so he didn't like that. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, um, a lot of progressives, actually, the early original progressives did learn a lot from uh, from European models. New Zealand was a model for some of them as well. Do you think it's possible, all right, so we're talking about theoretical consistency between social democracy and sort of open borders or not having a nation. Let me ask you uh, this, Amity. Do you think it, uh, uh, do you think it is possible to have a democracy without property? Uh, can, can you be both democratic and... and I, I don't. I don't. Pro I, think, I think property is very important and we we convey that idea poorly, but I want to push back a bit on the idea that there's nowhere to run if you want to be a less taxed entrepreneur, say. Um, that's what they thought in the 1960s. One of the characters in my recent book is Walter Ruther, the leader of the United Auto Workers, a very lovable social democrat. Yes. Um, and he in the auto industry, complicit with Henry Ford, said, no one will ever go anywhere. What is Japan? Um, it's a place we might sell some cars that might get some unions like ours. Uh, and while Walter was Ruther, um, and it's a name we heard on the radio every night when we were growing up and on TV, and the UAW and the big three of Detroit were building Detroit and a social democracy in the auto industry of the very type Michael's describing, they were rendering us uncompetitive and the Toyotas were rolling off the docks in California. Um, and when they looked up from building their social democracy, they saw that these foreign automakers made better cars that were um, also far more fuel efficient. And this did lead us to Flint, for example. The reason Flint and Detroit are in trouble is not because an individual governor or mayor messed up. It's because the growth in those areas for decades has chosen to stay away. So why would today be different? Some unpredicted, less taxed or more free or less regulated place will be the place where the money will go and we will lose out if we don't keep our our regime competitive. I want to add one other thing, which we have to discuss. Right for a second. There's, there's you know, generally uh, the discussion that the currency we take for granted and the dollar is always it and will always be the currency of reserve. I think we will feel the pressure against the social democratic state in Congress somewhat from the Republicans who are there, but even more strongly through the currency and inflation. Mm -hmm. Because the international market will tell us eventually we're spending too much and we'll have to stop. It's the money um, and its flows that will tell the government when to stop, not the political opposition. Over the past 20 years or longer, uh, perhaps even 30 years or whatever, we have scaled down taxes, we have uh, reduced regulation, we have moved in the direction of democratic capitalism and so forth, and this has resulted in great uh, 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 inequality, I would say, uh, suggesting that uh, whereas uh, 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 socialism, uh, left to its own devices or whatever, leads to, uh, to an extreme which must be modified in some way, does capitalism require a kind of social democracy of sorts? Does it require that uh, uh, in order to achieve uh, something that we would call social justice? I think so. I think so, yeah. yeah. I think, um, you know, the, the, most, the, the most egalitarian uh, economy we ever had was between the 1930s and the 1960s. Correct. When unions were strong, when regulation was strong, um, and since uh, you know, it's called the Great Compression right. uh, by many economists and right. historians. Since the early 70s, we've gone the other direction. As you know, unions have gotten weaker, uh, and um, and incomes have have stalled for for most Americans. Is they that... began to go up in the 1990s, then they went down again. Um, so, you know, I think. Um, Yes, in fact, uh, if you want a more decent, more egalitarian society under capitalism, I'd say, uh, you have to have 
much more uh, aspects of social democracy. Capitalism doesn't have to be immoral, and it doesn't need socialism to make it moral. Even if you go back to Adam Smith and the theory of moral sentiments, men and women must be good and are good often without a government to tell them to be good. When, when we look at Scandinavia, what are we looking at historically? A nation, nations created by the Protestant church. Right, um, and even today, when you go to Scandinavia, when you get to know it, um, whatever people say, it, it, it's still almost like a church culture. Right there, well, whether they profess about practicing religion, we are a, a diverse, wilder right. country. Right. Well, I think that's what Adam um, Adam Smith said. There is such a thing as moral a moral background sure. where one person trusts another, where the community gets together and does a lot through charity. And that is significant as well. So it's not the opposition between kindness and capitalism as two op opposites. That is a false opposition. Uh, are we really in a fundamental debate uh, in this country over the way we are going to organize ourselves going forward? Do, does the AOC Bernie Sanders phenomenon signal uh, a real change uh, in the way we've been looking at our economy and our society over the last 30 years, or has, in fact, history ended uh, and we are just uh, uh, simply uh, tinkering at the edges? It's clear that one, nothing is new. It is just forgotten. It is clear that socialism, the term, is popular now because too few people, too few adults, can recall what socialism is like. The Cold War seems more than another century away to younger people. The experience of the East Bloc, um, the experience even in Venezuela seems foreign to them. So they're unwilling to concede the evidence of socialism and they're idealistic. That's what we have in common with the early 60s. That doesn't mean, however, that socialism works. It means we better do a better job of showing what socialism's effect is. By comparing this with the 1960s, you're, what you're implying there, uh, Amity, is that socialism is a sentiment. That uh, uh, the, the egalitarianism of the early 60s was a sentiment. This was song and culture, uh, which turned into the, uh, the roaring 80s and the Clinton uh, economy and, the, uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, so it turned into neoliberalism. Uh, so it was not a genuine, uh, I would say, impulse in American politics at that time. But Michael, what do you say? Are, are, we, uh, are we debating fundamentals here? There are three models in the world today, I would say. One is the Chinese model, which is, which is authoritarian capitalism with a mixed economy in some ways. And, and of course, there's lots of people, you know, the Russians are, you know, a poor way of uh, having that kind of economy in some ways. Um, some other nations like Vietnam are trying to do that as well. Uh, then we have... Um, more neoliberal economies to size, like the United States, I think, has been, as you mentioned, for a while, since the last 20, 30 years. Uh, Joe Biden's administration, I think, is going to try to move it away from that. And we have more social democratic societies, mixed economies, like many societies in Europe, like Uruguay, uh, Costa Rica, a few other small right. countries in the world. And, you know, I think uh, uh, we'll have to see, you know, who wins out. A wonderful discussion. As I say, this is uh, something that has taken me by surprise, given my age, uh, that uh, ideas, you're, you're right, Amity, a triumph that we thought we, we, we were celebrating forever uh, in the late 1980s would suddenly find currency uh, with the rebirth of terms and so forth that we thought that we had left behind us uh, for, for many years. And what this means in practical policy terms will play out. But thank you both very much for uh, your time and uh, your contributions today. For people of a certain age, my age, for example, the resurgence of the banner of socialism in American politics seems quite strange. But the 21st century thus far has been a pretty tough time for the American dream. We have certainly seen rising economic inequality, lower labor participation rates, and large swaths of the American people from older folks in rural communities, which are increasingly economically non-viable to highly educated millennials unable to earn enough to form families and buy homes in the face of large student debt to the trap sense among non-college educated working class. Perhaps it's natural, therefore, that calls for bold and big action of the sort the United States hasn't seen or heard since the Great Depression. Perhaps that makes sense. 
Whether one calls structural changes in the economy socialism or not, one can hardly deny the underlying pressures for change coming from both the ideological left or the populist right. Is democratic socialism in some form the future of the American political economy? We leave it to you to answer those questions in your own way for yourselves. Once again, for The Whole Truth, I'm David Eisenhower. Thanks for watching. This episode of The Whole Truth was made possible by William and Susan Doran, UGI Corporation, and by To recap, the mascot, or the jingle. When you're in a fender bender, there's three letters to remember, NJM. No jingles or mascots, NJM. CNX Resources Corporation. Raza Bokhari, John and Patricia Walsh, the Charles Koch Institute, 